Hey, what's up guys? Hope you're all doing really, really well. Screencast video this week and I wanted to do a continuation from uh, another screencast I did, which was how does a computer work? And where we left off with that video was last time we talked about how does one computer work and I did two screencasts about that. And we left off saying, how does that lead to many computers working? So this video, it's going to be distributed computing basics, distributed computing 101, but more than one computer. So basic prerequisites before we get started, please watch the other screencast first, how does a computer work, two parts in that video, and also this internet playlist that I have. All these words should mean something to you, internet sockets, IP, web frameworks, HTTP, browsers, hosting. If this is super does not make sense to you, maybe this video is not going to make sense to you. So check that out first and I have to think of a better way to group all this stuff together because YouTube and playlists is not the optimal way to group things. So maybe I have to make like a curriculum or something. But let's just take it up where we left off last time. So we talked about this concept of inter-process communication on one computer last time when multiple processes can talk to each other. So what does that really mean for a network, right? If you think about it, all network information movement is inherently inter-process because they're on different computers. Your browser right now, it's a different computer, it's a different process than the YouTube server process that's running. So of course, network communication is gonna be a form of inter-process communication, but it's almost just a given. So people don't call it that. Um, people don't call network communication IPC or inter-process. We just call it distributed computing. And this quick video is going to showcase two broad strategies or styles of doing communication between computers. So the thing I want to introduce, the whole concept of this video is these two categories. It's synchronous versus asynchronous communication and before we get started these are really abstract concepts all right synchronous and asynchronous do not refer to anything that's concrete just think of these as styles so there's many ways to implement an asynchronous style of communication likewise there are many ways to implement a synchronous style of communication so you can't say my system is implemented asynchronously because that sentence is meaningless right these are just abstract concepts and we're going to talk a little bit implementation too later in this video. So first just want to talk synchronous style because this is what everyone is used to. Uh, I'm, a lot of examples in this video but this is the most common example of synchronous style of communication is your standard blocking HTTP call. Everyone's used to this. If you're a developer you must be used to this. This is when you hit an endpoint or you go to a web page and you make a blocking HTTP call to some resource on the internet. So this is pretty easy, but the flow goes something like this. Client makes a request and waits. Service gets a request, does something. After it's finished doing something, it sends a response back to the client. Client gets the response and resumes wherever they left off, right? And these colors are just symbolizing different processes. So this is blocking from the sense of the client, right? When step one happens, the client can't progress until steps two and three on the server finish. So the client will not move forward until that request comes back. Comes back. So that's kind of the essence of blocking, and that's what makes it synchronous, all right? Just let that sink in for a bit, and I think it's going to make more clear sense when we compare it with asynchronous stuff, but on the back end, the server could process the request in many different ways. Steps two and three is the back end server processing whatever you requested, but it could do it many different ways. It could be slow, it could be fast, it could hit a database, it could hit a cache, it could write a file, it could read a file. It can do whatever it wants, but all it needs to do is at the end of the day, it has to send back the response back to the client to unblock it. You can't just stall out and like you can't take more than 10 seconds 20 seconds after some time if you do not respond to the client something is going to time out the server should time out or the client will just close the request and move on so 
This is the essence of blocking, and I hope that makes sense. So when things get a little more cool is when we kind of talk about asynchronous style of communication. And before I get into what this really means, remember this is abstract. This means nothing if you say it just like this. It's just asynchronous is a style, and the example I want to use is Amazon.com. So what exactly happens when you click confirm purchase on Amazon? What do you think happens on their system? Um, I don't really know, but I'm going to guess a lot of things. Okay, so what do you physically see? What do you physically see? Can't type. Sorry. What do you physically see when you press this button on Amazon? Well, your computer usually gets redirected to a success screen that says, thanks, Bob, for your purchase. Please shop with us again. That's what you see as a client, right? And you continue your day with your shopping. You're not blocked by anything. So let's talk about what's more interesting, which is what you do not see. What do you not see when you click confirm purchase on Amazon? But this pretty much kicks off a lot of Amazon's backend services. I don't work at Amazon. Um, I don't. I know a couple people that work, but this is only my guess at what's happening. So, Amazon's payment system kicks in to withdraw from your bank account. Amazon's inventory system kicks in to track the item, track the item count of what you just bought. You know, items available minus minus. Amazon's analytics gets an update with your purchase statistics, so machine learning kicks in, models are retrained, your recommendations are improved. Uh, Amazon vendors have to get notified to start preparing the items you just bought to ship them. Amazon dispatch has to be notified to make sure you get the, the warehouses ready to deliver your product within two days. So just infinite stuff. This is like there must be so many things that are kicked off in Amazon system when you press that green button that I can't even fathom it, but this is just my best guess at the big ones. So I think at this point you should be getting the picture of what's happening when you press confirm. This is a very asynchronous style of experience. So the summary I want to get across with this Amazon example is that this kind of experience is very asynchronous because you can keep moving on to do your shopping while things are happening in the background. You don't have to wait for all this stuff to happen. It's happening after you click the button, but you can still continue shopping. So just imagine, what if this was a synchronous experience, right? If this was a very synchronous transaction, you would have to wait for all those backend services to complete before moving on, and it would probably be a very terrible user experience. Um, this is a very common case where a lot one button creates a lot of things in the background that are done at some later point in time, but there are still times when we need very synchronous transactions. And I have a couple examples here. So there are cases when things should be very synchronous and blocking. So if you're transferring money to and from bank accounts or you're handling a very precious type of transaction in your favorite video game, the application might actually elect or opt to block and wait until everything is successful but tell, before telling you that everything's okay. So there are some situations where it will be a synchronous kind of experience where you have to wait until everything is good to go before moving on. But many times when you click buttons on websites like this, a lot of stuff is happening in the background that you don't know about. And that's the essence of asynchronous stuff. So. Let's just keep it moving. Hopefully that distinction is now clear, right? Just a quick recap before we move on, but you should be getting a feel for sync versus async. Async is more interesting, so let's just talk about it a little more and get a little less abstract, all right? The first common way to do asynchronous communication is something called message queuing, and this is really a common way that notifications are passed throughout a large system. So we can just go back to our Amazon example, but the moment we press confirm purchase, a special message and payload is generated and put into a queue, a message queue for processing. So imagine a payload, something like this, purchase item on website, item ID, date, user, me, uh, user ID, I paid 350 bucks for this, it's not prime, special instructions, please put a ribbon on my package. So other systems in Amazon have the ability to observe messages in the queue 
And you know, this payload was generated when I pressed some button. So when this payload is broadcasted, the payments, analytics, inventory system, they're all gonna kick in. They're gonna kind of say, oh, Dave just purchased something. Let me kick off my special uh, processes and workflows to handle that. So this general style of communication is also known as PubSub or publisher subscriber. You might've heard this phrase before, but it's a very broadcast style of communication. So it's like just broadcast something and if, you, if that's important to you, do something, but I'm just broadcasting this. So um, with that said, I also wanna say message cues in general are very flexible. So PubSub is not the only style of message queuing. You can use message queues in very different ways. You can use it to communicate directly between two computers. So if the website, the website, Amazon website could send very specialized messages to Amazon payments via a very special message queue and it doesn't have to blast out the whole system, all right? So message queues are a very, very common technique in way different parts of a system communicate asynchronously. All right, hope that makes sense. The last one I wanna talk about is a very easy one, another very common form of asynchronous communication and that's this concept of web hooks. So um, it sounds complicated, it's not complicated, this is very simple. The only mental model you need for this idea is that think of these as callbacks between computers. Okay, callbacks between computers. For all the programmers watching this, you should be familiar with coding or programmatic callbacks, like execute this thing first and then call this function when it's done, or execute this request and call my success function if nothing broke. Execute this request and call my fail function if something broke, right? These are all special callbacks based on certain scenarios. So webhooks, all a webhook is, is essentially callbacks between computers. All right, that's the mental model and just keep that in the back of your brain. So one example I thought of is like syncing with Salesforce. All right, this is very common. Whoops. So you're a software developer. You decide that you need to integrate with Salesforce. Salesforce is a very popular SaaS platform to track your customers. You should have heard about this. But let's say you want to keep important copy of Salesforce data on your system to track some kind of analytics how do you keep those two different systems in sync? Um, one really easy way to do it, uh, that's kind of, you know, maybe a little error prone or slow, but you could re-import the data every hour or every night, and that's kind of cool. You can just re-sync it whenever you want. But what happens if the data changes very fast? What happens if you have 1,000 employees updating Salesforce data all the time? How do you keep it all in sync? Salesforce is like somewhere in the cloud. It's outside your control. So how do you, how do you manage to sync that data with your system? You can do that with something called webhooks. So all you do is you pretty much tell Salesforce, hey, anytime data changes on your system, I want you to call this special webhook or callback which hits my system. So I'll say that again, anytime data changes on your system, I want you to call this special webhook, which hits my system. So the flow is kind of like this. An employee logs into Salesforce, changes a user's email address on the Salesforce website, right? Salesforce calls a special registered webhook, which hits your application. So the moment Salesforce recognizes that a user has changed its data, it's gonna call a special webhook which is my super app, Dave, API, Salesforce user updated, right? And then what happens is my app receives the call from Salesforce and it does whatever it has to do to sync up the stuff. And it can do this processing, you know, whenever it needs to do. So it's essentially a callback. I think you guys can just, I've elaborated it way too much, but the very essence of it is just a callback function, but just think of it as a callback function between computers. All right, so that's all I had for today. Um, just made it in time. Just doing a basic recap, there's a lot more to talk about for distributed computing, but the essence is how do multiple computers communicate with each other? And there's tons of different ways, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, what we just talked about, client-server. There's just many different styles, and it's pretty much how huge systems on the internet operate. All right, so 
Hope you enjoyed the video and let's talk more about this next time. All right, guys.